outside. My wife and I, uh, we've been taking a lot more walks uh, together and it's been helping our marriage and it's just a beautiful day and we're already thinking of where to go for a walk. You know, so Sunday, uh, find the park or something. So uh, I will end in half an hour, but uh, we, we're working on our theme of the kingdom of God. And uh, we're coming towards the end, actually. So we have uh, servanthood, the pathway to the kingdom today. Next Sunday, we're looking at the cross and the kingdom. And uh, what is the relationship between faith and works? That's a huge question because we're saved by faith. But at the same time, a faith that does not work is not true faith. So uh, I, I might be able to provide some light to that by bringing in a different category. And then we're going to look at Paul's gospel. What is Paul's gospel in its relation to Jesus' gospel? I think they're the same. And then lastly, uh, the last Sunday of April, we're going to look at Revelation 21 and 22 and the ending of it. And then that will close us off. And then Galatians with uh, uh, um, will start uh, later on. So let's uh, one second. So we are looking at the kingdom of God, and you can see the subtitle there, From Oppressive Power to Humble Service. So uh, what I'm trying to argue here today, um, the newness of the gospel isn't so much uh, the kingdom of God itself. Certainly the kingdom of God is at hand. That is good news. But even more revealing when you read the gospels is the nature of that kingdom. So I, I remember one of the theologians way back when he had written uh, what Jesus was trying to do was start a revolution against revolutions. And I, I like that phrase because uh, it's a new kind of revelation that is against all the old forms of revelation. Or to put it in a different way, this is about God presenting a new kingdom that is against all the old kingdoms of uh, the past. So uh, that's why I have from oppressive power to humble service. It's the nature of the kingdom that is being emphasized in the gospels and today. So if you take a look here, and I got a couple of passages before I start, but for even a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Yeah, the main form in which the kingdom of God exists is to service and the main act of service that Jesus offers is giving his life a ransom for many. And we take a look at another passage, uh, Matthew 11, my yoke is easy for I am gentle and humble in heart. It's the humility of God expressed in servanthood. That's the key component that tells us what the kingdom of God is like. And that's the revolution against all other revolutions, which tend to be violent, bloodshedding and warfare. And then Philippians 2, obviously, he humbled himself by becoming obedient, even death on a cross. This is his act of servanthood, which is an expression of his humility and obedience to the Father. And then the next slide, I found this, and I know it's a little imposing at first, but I'm going to give you a few moments. So if you look at the right side, you have all of these qualities or attributes of God. That's uh, in terms of being, purpose his mental, moral, and then you got summary, and then incommunicable, ones that cannot be transferred to humanity. So that was like 20 different attributes there. And my question is, when I look at those 20 attributes, where is humility? Why isn't humility an attribute of God? In fact, God, Jesus says, you know, I'm humble at heart. You know, in humility, he died even to the point of the cross. And I find this very interesting. In fact, there's a Japanese theologian who had written that, Western theologies tend to not emphasize humility of God, but the power of God because of their frame of reference. But Eastern theologies, and for him being Japanese, Japanese theologies tend to emphasize the humility of God. And I thought that was really interesting because when I went through seminary, humility was not listed as an attribute and the incarnation seems to be a clear indication that God is a very humble God. Yes, powerful, but also very humble. Now, I used to do this then uh, in, at Moody, you know, introduction to philosophy class. I would ask people, hey, um, call out an attribute of God. Very first one, almost always, is omnipotence or power. 
and then they will call out. And then when they were done, I would ask, hey, where is humility? Why isn't God omni-humble? You know, he's omnipotent, omnipotent omnipresent, uh, omniscient. Where is omni-humility when God can become human through the incarnation? And I think we miss that part. And that's why we have such a misunderstanding of the kingdom, that it is not about power through oppression, but it is power through serving others. So that's what I want to do today for the next 30 minutes. Jesus is going to the disciples to reframe the disciples' mindset. The kingdom is coming, but it's not the kind of kingdom you thought it was. From kingdom as oppressive power, lorded over them, to kingdom as humble service. I think that's what he's trying to do for quite a bit of the gospel. So, so point number one, for being God with unlimited power, Jesus is surprisingly restrained in its use. And so, you know, way back then, I used to imagine that uh, I would have the gift of healing, you know, what I would do. And, you know, if I had the gift of healing, I would go all over the place, especially hospitals would heal people and say, yeah, listen to the gospel here. Here's uh, its authentication and heal people. Just go around and heal and just use the power all over. But when I look at the life of Jesus, yes, he heals and he heals in certain parts of his ministry quite a bit, but he is very restrained in his power to heal uh, over nature, over uh, the demonic forces. Uh, in fact, one way to look at this is uh, there are a number of apocrypha literature. So these are uh, books that did not make it into the canon of God, into the canon of the Bible, which have stories of what Jesus would have been like when he was young. And by looking at those, we get a picture of sort of if I was writing a biography of God as a child, this is what I would write. So uh, this is really interesting. So Jesus and the 12 sparrows, uh, one day Jesus goes down to a creek and then he creates a little ford, a little bit of water, uh, uh, walled off on the rest of the creek. And then uh, he's creating a little bit of mud. And then this boy comes along, the son of Anus, and this boy breaks the little wall and mixes the water within with the water of the stream. And Jesus gets angry and he turns the boy into a withered stick. He dries him up and the boy dies. And then Jesus takes the mud from that little creek area. And then he makes 12 clay sparrows and then he breathes into them. They come to life and they fly away. And then he goes home, and what he finds is that the anus, uh, the father of this boy, has come to Joseph to complain, and then Jesus raises this boy back to life. So these are sort of like uh, made-up stories of what Jesus would have been like as a child, being God. Here's another one, you know, Jesus going to school. He goes to school, and the problem is that he already knows everything that the teacher knows. So he's uh, uh, omniscient. And so there's nothing really to be taught. So that in one of the uh, Gospel of Thomas, it says, uh, this is Jesus saying, uh, as a child, saying to the teacher, you say what things you know, but I understand more things than you. For before the ages I am, behold, you do not believe me now. When you see my cross, then you will believe that I speak the truth. Right? How do you teach God in school? You know, that's sort of the uh, stories they're trying to explain. Here's another one, sage of the law of God. You think Joseph is my father. It is not he. I was before your beginning. It is I who am the sage. I know every thought that has been in your heart. You know, it's sort of like teacher asks a question and you can read his mind and you can give the answer. So you have all of these stories of what it would be like for God to be a child. And then you have this, this story of Zeno. So they're walking on the rooftop of the home. And then Zeno falls to the ground and the parents come and they accuse Jesus of pushing Zeno off. And Jesus didn't do that. And so he gets all upset and he raises Zeno to life in order to ask Zeno the question, did I push you off the roof? And Zeno says, no. So these are the types of uh, stories. Uh, this is Jesus in the leaky water jar so that uh, Mary sends Jesus to the well to get some water. And he goes with this water jar but the water jar has a hole and the water is leaking. So he takes off his cloak and he puts the water in his cloak and he carries it and none of the water leaks. And then it says Mary uh, saw this and uh, remembered it and kept it in her heart. So, uh, and these are all apocrypha. Uh, my favorite story. So Carpenter, G Joseph is uh, building a bed and he's cutting wood for the support. 
and he cut uneven pieces. So he didn't know what to do. And so Jesus goes and he takes the shorter uh, piece of the wood and then he stretches it out so that it's the same length as the longer one. <laughs> that, that would be wonderful if you ever did carpentry work and you get uneven pieces. And the story goes on now that whenever Joseph had uneven pieces, he would just call Jesus and Jesus would correct the error. No need to measure twice when you have Jesus uh, around. And so you have these stories to indicate what it would be like for God to be a child. And I, you know, when I read these stories, I'm amazed that the adult Jesus in the Gospels is very restrained in the power that he uses. Because I don't think he wants to be known for that kind of power. He uses power to authenticate who he is so that he can point to it. But the kingdom is not about that kind of power. Point two, Israel chooses a kingdom of power over kingdom of service. Now, you may not realize where this occurs, but for me, there's an explicit event in the Gospels found in all four Gospels where the Israelites and Israel's leaders choose power over service explicitly. And it occurs in the Barnabas scene. So I'll read Matthew 27 at the feast, uh, the governor is accustomed to releasing for the crowd any one prisoner. And they had a prisoner, he's a notorious prisoner by the name of Barabbas, right? So you remember the story. And Pilate says to the people, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy the religious leaders delivered him up. Now, here's a choice between Barabbas and Jesus. Now, Barabbas is an insurrectionist. He's sort of like a zealot who wants to overthrow the Roman government through violence. So there the translation is notorious prisoner. Here, uh, and then Matthew 27, you know, the people choose uh, Barabbas over Jesus. And then here in John 18, look at the bottom right. Now, Barabbas was a robber, or the translation could be insurrectionist. So that's in the footnote, insurrectionist, because he wants to overthrow the Roman government through violence. And then this is Mark 15, he's called a rebel. So, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And then lastly in Luke, yeah, you had the uh, most the expanded description, uh, but they all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. So now, on the one hand, you have someone who wants to overthrow uh, the Roman government through violence and establish Israel as an independent kingdom. And then you have Jesus, who is the king of the Jews, but the way he wants to do it is not for sword and violence. In fact, when Peter slops, uh, chops off the year of the high priest's servant, he heals, because that's not the way he wants to go. Now, the people have a choice. Do you want Barabbas? and what he offers, his path, or Jesus and his path. Now, what's even fascinating is that if you look at Matthew 27 in the NIV version, Barabbas' name is Jesus. So it's uh, a well-known prisoner, second line, whose name was Jesus Barabbas, because many of the manuscripts had Jesus as his uh, uh, name. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, the one called Messiah? I, I find this highly fascinating. They're both saviors. One will save you through violence. One will save you by suffering, sacrifice, and uh, through servanthood. Which Jesus do you want? And the Israelites chose the Jesus of Barabbas rather than the Jesus of Messiah. And so that's the choice that is made. Now, throughout this Gospels, what is occurring is Jesus has to teach the disciples that it's not Barabbas' way, but it's the, uh, the, the cross. That's the way to the kingdom. And what I want to do here is I'm going to stay in Mark. And in Mark, the whole story is about Jesus making his way to Jerusalem on Passover a week, uh, Matthew 14 and 15. And as they're going, there are three cycles of dialogue. So Jesus is walking with the disciples, three different settings, 
but it's all walking and teaching. So I'm going to read these passages because he's teaching them the same thing. He's going to suffer and you have to suffer, but through your suffering, the kingdom will come. So uh, this is the famous story of who do uh, men say that I am? Do, do they say John the Baptist or Elijah or the other prophets? Peter says, you are the Christ. And then Jesus tells him not to tell others about it, not yet. And then he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be killed and raised on the third day. And then Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your things on God, but on the things of man. And then, uh, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said, now this is his teaching. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross. Like Jesus is taking up the cross, you have to take up the cross. How does Jesus bring the kingdom of God? Through the cross, suffering, love, sacrifice. How will the disciples expand the kingdom of God? Through the cross, through sacrifice, through servanthood, through love. It's the same pattern. Now in Mark 9, 1, so I... It says uh, well, that uh, the Son of Man will not be ashamed when he comes in glory with the heavenly angels, our holy angels. And then you have this interesting passage in chapter 9, verse 1. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. That power that's being referred to is the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the a passage that comes right after and in the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus, in the, their supernatural light, and the Heavenly Father speaks, and Moses and Elijah is there. And you see the kingdom in its glory, but the transfiguration is connected to the crucifixion. Because, stay with me here, the transfiguration is where you see God's kingdom and glory. The crucifixion, which doesn't look like a glorious moment, is the hour of glory. That's what John says, the hour of glory, because Jesus is not only glorified in the transfiguration in a way with that we would expect, but Jesus is also glorified in the crucifixion in a way that we did not expect. So uh, this is from Jeremy Treat, and he compares these two, and he shows the connections here. So in the transfiguration, you have this unearthly light that shines from heaven, and then you have supernatural darkness, like an eclipse in the crucifixion. The clothes are luminous for Jesus. The clothes are shipped off in the crucifixion. Two Old Testament saints, Moses, Elijah, the two criminals in the crucifixion, conversation with Elijah, apparent conversation Jesus has with Elijah. And then the disciples are present, disciples flee. And then God speaks in the transfiguration. God is silent in the crucifixion. What Treat, Jeremy Treat is arguing is that the glory of the transfiguration is seen in the glory of the crucifixion. But when we look at the crucifixion, we don't think of the glory of God because we have different mindset about what the kingdom of God is like. So I'm going to read this uh, in Treat's words, uh, Jeremy Treat. Uh, while the continuity reveals that Jesus truly is the Messiah who reigns from the cross, transfiguration to the cross, the contrast reveals his glorious kingship is paradoxically hidden in his gruesome death. The radiance of his glory is seen as darkness, his power as weakness, and his kingdom as servanthood. The majestic glory of Christ that will be hidden paradoxically in his suffering. And I, I really love this because I see this in John. You know, the hour of glory is the hour of suffering because Jesus' glory is most manifested in the cross. And then in the Gospel of John, when it says that Jesus will be lifted up, the word lifted up has a double meaning. When you lift up Jesus, you can be worshiping him, praising him. And then lifting up Jesus is when Jesus was lifted up on the cross. So that we lift up Jesus in terms of worship because Jesus was lifted up in terms of the cross. We recognize his glory through worship because the most glorious moment for God was when he died on the cross as our servant to redeem us. The kingdom of God is built through service. Now, here's the... The second cycle, so they're walking once again, and they are passing through Galilee. 
And he did not want anyone to know if he was teaching his disciples. Once again, the son of man is to be delivered to the hands of men. They will kill him. And when he is dead, he will rise on the third day. But they did not understand the saying and they were afraid to ask why. It's not that they didn't understand the words. They just couldn't put together what Jesus was saying about the Messiah dying and the nature of the kingdom they were expecting were paradoxical that they couldn't fit it together. It was a mystery. And then look at the next passage. And they came to Capernaum. And while he was in the house, he asked them, what were you talking about on the way? But they kept silent because they were arguing who was the greatest. Who was the greatest among them all, right? And then Jesus sat them down and he called the child to them. And he says, look, this child, whoever receives such a one in my name receives me because uh, the greatest of you is the one who is most serving of the other, right? So if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all because the nature of the kingdom is servanthood. That's how you're great, right? Power, not through violence, but power by self-sacrificing yourself for someone else. And obviously in the gospel of John, that's when no one wanted to get up and wash the other's feet with a bowl of water. So Jesus does that to show them this is what the kingdom of, the, of God is like. And then the last cycle, the last third one, and they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking ahead and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid and talking to the 12 again, verse 33, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over the scribes and condemned to death. See, this is the same. This is the uh same theme third time over. In other words, this is how important this text is. And then they will mock him, spit on him, and kill him, and the third day he will rise. Very similar. Now, James and John, sons of Zebedee, uh, Zebedee came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit on your right hand and in your left in your glory. And Jesus said to him, you don't know what you're asking for. See, it's, this is the same third cycle. Jesus talks about his suffering in order to bring about the kingdom. And the disciples do not want to pick up the cross and follow after him. But instead, their view of the kingdom is one of power, glory, of uh, uh, oppression through violence. And Jesus is trying to reframe this mindset so that they understand what the kingdom of God is truly like. Uh, but, and when I mean, the ten heard of what the, uh, John and James were talking about, they became indignant. Jesus called to them and said, we know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. See, and remember, this is that uh, mark where Jesus said, I did not come to serve, but uh, to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. And he's demonstrating that this is what the kingdom of God is like through these cycles. And the disciples are having a hard time. Now, I'll just finish this section. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's the transition that Jesus wants to do. In fact, if we look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is the, the commands for the kingdom of God, yeah, so whoever compels you to go one mile, I'll go with you too. See, you cannot connect Jesus with violent oppression because in this saying, this is where a Roman soldier can come up to a, a, a Jew and say, look, I want you to carry my uh, military gear for one mile. And uh, the, the, the Israelite was uh, compelled to carry it one mile and Jesus carried it an extra mile. See, that would be a weird thing for a zealot or an insurrectionist to do, to help your enemies uh, in their, to facilitate their oppressive reign over your country. And Jesus comes, and says, look, if he slaps you on the left side, turn to him to the right. I mean, these are all passages designed to reframe our understanding of the kingdom of God. It is a revolution against all human revolutions because the kingdom of God cannot be established on violence, but to the cross, to uh, love and grace and sacrifice. And this is why this is a, you know, Christ is a stumbling block to the Jews, right? So um, you got Galatians 5, but in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the, the gospel is foolishness to uh, uh, to the Greeks and then a stumbling block to the Jews because 
their view of the kingdom did not match what happened to the life of Jesus as the Messiah. And that's why, you know, in the road to Emmaus, the two disciples, we thought he was the Messiah. But how can the Messiah be crucified? Because the nature of the kingdom he's supposed to start isn't built by the cross, but it's built by power. See, that's what they're thinking. And I, you know, there's one more. I think this is why John the Baptist had that doubt. Remember uh, in Matthew 11, he sends two disciples to Jesus. Are you the one who is to come or should we wait for another? Because he's waiting for that part where Jesus, or where God will uh, punish the enemies of Israel, um, but, but it's not occurring. And uh, I think he's filled with doubt. Wait a minute, the kingdom program is not being carried out in the way that I thought. And Jesus's ministry is about teaching the people if the kingdom is about love and service, not oppression. Uh, and then uh, last point, Christ's view of the kingdom is the primary one. Oh, actually, that's different. That was, I just did that. So, you know, Christ is the a stumbling block because the Jews are expecting uh, a mighty warrior type. And uh, it's just, you don't have a crucified Messiah that will establish that kind of kingdom. So that's the shift that's occurring. When we come to uh, next week, uh, the next week's Bible study, what will happen is uh, uh, we will look at the connection between servanthood as the means for bringing about the kingdom of God and the cross. And then I will argue that it's not faith alone that saves, and it's not works that saves, but there's a unique combination of the two that will bring about the uh, salvation. So it is faith that leads to works, and that is what brings about the, uh, the kingdom of God. So you know, just in real quick summary, so the, the bulk of the gospel is about Jesus reframing in the minds of the disciples to get rid of the earthly kingdom mindset that they have, you know, revolutions through violence, all human revolutions generally through violence or oppressive power. But Jesus's kingdom is revol revolution, but the kind of revolution that he brings is winning others through love. Uh, it's by sacrifice. And so it's a whole different kind of kingdom, a different kind of revolution. So uh, just three more studies left after that. Um, any questions or thoughts? All right. <laughs> the, the best kind of class, no questions, and we get to go out uh, four minutes early. <laughs> that's, that's great. And you're not paying tuition anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so thank you for uh, joining and uh, um, have a great week and hopefully